Well, good morning, y'all. Welcome. So glad you are here. So we're just going to dive into real talk for a minute. Are you ready? Uh, real talk. How many of you, it is your pet peeve when you make a phone call, send an email, or send a text, and you hear nothing back? Anyone in the room? All right. I appreciate you admitting it. Saturday at 6 o'clock, no one admitted it. So then it started with me calling people liars. We need to pray for you. It was So thank you for, um, for admitting that. Uh, it's even worse, I think, when you know for certain it is someone who always has their phone in their hand. You know what I'm talking about? I'm like, if you are watching kitty cat videos on YouTube and you are swiping me out of the way, we've got problems, you know? Unless it's a Mr. Kitty video, then it's worth it. That will be my only Mr. Kitty reference in the whole sermon, I promise. How about when it tells you that it's been read? Y'all, tip for the people who read them, you can turn that off in the settings, okay? They never need to know that you read the text message. And then on top of it, what about when you get like the dot, dot, dot on the iPhone and you're like, uh, and then it just goes away and they don't send anything. So you actually took the time to begin writing a message back. You're like, not worth it. You know, like I'm out. Well, uh, this next part is called confession time with Josh. Um, I am the person who does the, does the very thing that I just talked about, all right? I am the absolute worst. Let me give you case in point. Um, a few weeks ago, I was texting Matthew, who's playing keys and leading us in worship this morning. I was texting him, and it was something that like, I needed a pretty quick response on. And he just sends me back. He doesn't answer my text message. He sends me back a screenshot of the message that I just sent him. And we have the screenshot so y'all can see it. So he screenshots my message. For those of you that have as bad of eyesight as I do, that is the number 79, meaning I had 79 missed text messages when I sent him my text. He screenshot and circled 79 five times. Also took the time to do it in multiple different colors. So... Thanks, Matthew. Didn't respond to my message. He just sent me a screenshot of how many missed messages I had. It was a very passive aggressive way of saying, check your stinking phone. Um, all right, so at this moment right now, I did this so you would know with full integrity, I'm telling you the truth. My email count is at 1,589 missed emails. Thank you, Angela, for letting me keep my job. Um, 67 missed text messages, 134 <laughs> missed phone calls, and I noticed this at 9.30 on the spot that I have nine missed notifications from my fitness pal because I won't tell them what my weight is because um, it feels very intrusive. And I'm probably going to delete that app a little bit later. <laughs> but I, I think when we get missed messages, it can become even harder when it's with someone that maybe has authority in our life or maybe someone who has influence in our life, someone that we care a lot about. And we send a message, we don't hear something back. If you're like me, I oftentimes can start building a narrative that does not exist in that moment of silence and waiting. Uh, that's just true admission to y'all. And then most of the time, it's not nearly as bad as what I have built up in my head. And then I would say even one step further, it's really hard when you're waiting to hear back from someone and you're in a moment of conflict. Like you're just waiting to hear back, I'm sorry, or I forgive you, or whatever that may be. But when you're in a time of conflict. Well, as we get into the book of Matthew, you're gonna see a group of people, the Israelites, who are in a very, very long season of waiting. They've been waiting for generations to hear from their king, to hear from their God, and to hear about the promised one that the prophets had told for centuries. And it must have been even harder because the Israelite people, as we look in the Old Testament, they shared an intimacy with God that was unlike any other. They had a closeness and a bond with the Lord. and They were his people. And you see all throughout the Old Testament, this ebb and flow of their relationship, like these mountaintop moments. And then we see these valley moments. But all the while, God has been faithful and sticks with them. But they had been awaiting to hear about their coming king for centuries. One of the uh, prophetic books in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, has this amazing prophecy that is about them waiting for their king 
It's found in Daniel chapter 7. It says this, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. I just want to hit pause there for one moment. In the book of Matthew, you're going to see several times uh, the author, Matthew, use language, very Jewish language, like the son of man or the son of David or the son of Abraham or the kingdom of heaven. Some terminology that may be a few thousand years removed, we don't get it the same way like they would have back then. But the son of man was one of those terminologies that he uses uh, frequently in the book of Matthew. And uh, it's, it's a really amazing turn of phrase because in the 6th century B.C., that exact terminology is used all throughout the book of Ezekiel. It's used 93 times to talk specifically about a human being. And then here in Daniel, the same century, it's specifically talking about the divine one who would step into time and be seated on his throne. We're about to step into this Christmas season and we're seeing six centuries before Jesus, the doctrine or the theology of the incarnation that God would step into time, put on human flesh, and walk amongst us. And that's what the Son of Man means. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, the Father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And hear this, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. They had been waiting for centuries for the coming king. And it must have been difficult because the last book that we get in the Old Testament is this book uh, called Malachi. And we read in the book of Malachi that it is, it is the exact words of the Lord being spoken through the prophet Malachi. And it's a really difficult book because really almost the entirety of that book was a, a, a book of rebuke. It was saying, you have continually been unfaithful. But here's what's really amazing. This is a side point, but I think it's so important that Malachi starts with God saying, I have loved you. It is coming from the heart of a father that loves his children. It is not a rebuke without a relationship. But he rebukes them. So they're in this season of conflict, y'all. And this is in 400 BC. And then all of a sudden, after this conflict, the book closes and it's just 400 years of silence. That was, unco was that uncomfortable? Like three seconds of silence? <laughs> 400 years of silence, waiting for their king. And that's, where we pick up in the book of Matthew. So you would imagine after 400 years of silence, you're gonna get just like this amazing pronouncement, all right? Are you ready for the very first thing that we read after 400 years of silence? This is the genealogy of Jesus. Thank you for the chuckles. There's some people in the room who are like, yeah, chapter two, you know, like <laughs> moving on. Because 2,000 years removed, you're like, all right, is there not gonna be like a trumpet sound? Like, burr, burr, burr. You know, like, here, that's a really good trumpet. You guys proud of me for that? It very much sounds like Blue's Clues. I realized that at 9.30, so, uh, yeah. Anyways, now that I just derailed a little bit, we'll get back on. But 400 years of silence, and then they hear this. This is the genealogy of Jesus. 2,000 years removed, that might be hard for us to get, but 2,000 years ago, y'all, this would have been the most amazing of announcements for these people. Chapter 1, verse 1 in Matthew says this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the saving one, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So why is this genealogy important? Just talk about a couple things. One is that terminology, the son of David. They were looking to the greatest king that Israel had ever known, but they knew that the Messiah, that their ultimate king, the king in which the kingdom would never be destroyed, the throne would never be destroyed, they believed that it was coming through the genealogy of David. And then all of a sudden, right here in the very first chapter, in the very first verse, Matthew is saying, he is here. Jesus is fulfilling the covenant of old, the Davidic covenant found in 2 Samuel, which says this, he is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The son of David, Jesus, is he. And then we read the son of Abraham, 
Similarly, there was a covenant made in Genesis chapter 12 to the Israelite people, and it was this, that through Abraham, all the nations would be blessed. And they had been waiting for the one who would come from the line of Abraham, from the line of David, who would fulfill this covenantal agreement. And here he is, Jesus, the one who would fulfill it and bless all the nations. And this is the covenant. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The Jewish people would have heard, this is the son of Abraham. This is the son of David. This is the anointed one, the Messiah. This is our king. Another thing that's interesting about this genealogy that Matthew, uh, Matthew uses this motif and he uses it a lot throughout the gospel of Matthew where he uses numbers purposefully to make us think a little harder about what he's saying. So in the genealogy in chapter one, he uses three different sets of 14 generations and he does it on purpose. And the reason I think Matthew is doing that is because he wants us to walk through a journey of scripture without having to talk about all of the scripture. But it, it, it harkens back to the Old Testament. So the very first set of 14 begins with Abraham and it ends with David. So this would have been, hey guys, remember the glory days? Remember when everything was looking up? Remember when you had entered into your promised land? Remember the greatest king you had ever known? Remember the covenants of old? And it would have brought something up in them that said, yes, I remember. And then the second set is a little more dire. It starts with David and then it ends with the Babylonian exile. So they were riding this high, but now they were in the lowest of lows that they have been kicked out of their promised land. They were longing for restitution, but really they were a nomadic tribe, just waiting for their king to invite them back into this kingdom that would be established. It was a dire season. And then the very last one of these sets of three Starts with the Babylonian exile, everything is wrong. We are in the valley place. And then it ends with Jesus, their Messiah. It's like Matthew is saying to us, look back and remember the glory days of Abraham and the glory days of David. Well, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because the king in which his throne will never, ever fade is here. I want to talk one last thing about this genealogy that I think is incredibly important and, y'all, would have caused everyone in that day to stop in their tracks. There are five different women whose names are used in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. We have Tamar, which I think is a really cool name, by the way. I posed to Deanna as I was saying it last night. This is not a good idea, by the way. I was like, hey, we're having a baby girl in February. That's a cool name. Maybe we can name her Tamar. Turn to do a discussion during the sermon not what I'm going to call my child, just so you all know, but Tamar is a cool name. It's a really cool name. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. It's important for a few reasons. One, that genealogies 2,000 years ago did not include women. So it's there for a reason. Our God believes that women are incredibly important. And right out of the gate, he's talking to a Jewish people and he brings up these women. Some of these women who have passed that are difficult. Some of these women who are Gentiles, they are outside the people of God. But five different women's names are used. And these women had passed that could disqualify them. Air quotes on purpose. Why? Because y'all, we have a God who qualifies us. So if you have found yourself wrestling with disqualifying yourself, please know this, that we have a God who qualifies us. Your past does not disqualify you. Please hear that this morning. If you hear nothing else, your past does not disqualify you. No matter what people may have said to you, y'all hear this, they're wrong. No matter what the voices in your head may say to you, those voices are wrong. Your past does not disqualify you. I read this quote from a pastor, his name is Zach Van Dyke, and he says this about the genealogies. These stories are all about grace. In reading about them, there's an invitation to say our story matters. That those parts of us we wanna hide maybe should be remembered and told. 
Shame stories can stay shame stories if they're in the dark, but when they're brought to the light, they can be grace stories. Your past does not disqualify you. Your family doesn't disqualify you. Anyone in the room? No? You're like, thank you, Jesus. Like, that should have gotten an amen from someone, I think. Like, Methodist or not, amen to that. Your family does not disqualify you. And then hear this, because I think this is one of the most profound things about chapter one. Your gender does not disqualify you. Your gender does not take away your voice. I don't know why this is even a topic of conversation anymore, because it's very, very clear that Jesus made a point to say that women should be heard. I mean, this is the Jesus who would walk through Samaria on purpose instead of going around it to meet with the Samaritan woman at the well whose past could have disqualified her, but he qualified her. He gave her a voice. She was sent to her village, and then all of a sudden, everyone in that Samaritan village came to know Jesus. He empowered the voice of someone who would be the outcast of the outcast. He does something similarly we talked about a few weeks ago in the book of Matthew where Jesus takes this journey. No one really knows why he takes this journey to Tyre, but he goes outside, miles outside of where he's going next. And the only thing that we get in the Bible is that he met with this Canaanite woman. And he met with a Canaanite woman, which is really important because the Canaanites are one of three of the major enemies of the Old Testament, one of the major enemies of the people of God. But Jesus goes out, he seeks after this woman, and he says, your faith has made your daughter healed. I don't know, Jesus seems to be in the business of empowering women, and it starts with the genealogy of Jesus. I love it. In a culture that repeatedly silenced the voices of women, Jesus continually empowered them to speak up. Jesus constantly pointed to their worth and value, and that began in Jesus' own lineage. So when we read the lineage of Jesus, y'all, We read, this is Jesus, the son of Abraham, the son of Tamar, the son of Ruth, the son of David, the son of Rahab, the son of Bathsheba, and this is Jesus, the son of Mary. He is your king, and he is here. And then Jesus, after the genealogy is talked about in the book of Matthew, he begins his public ministry. And that's where we get to our bottom line this morning. The bottom line is this, that Jesus is king and we are invited to be citizens and take part of his kingdom. Jesus is king and we are invited to be citizens in his kingdom. In the book of Matthew, then, Jesus starts talking about the kingdom of heaven in chapter four, and the kingdom of heaven is exclusive to the book of Matthew. It's not used in any other New Testament uh, gospel And it's purposeful, again, because Matthew is an incredibly Jewish book. And he uses the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God because the Jewish people, in reverence to Yahweh, would not say the name of Yahweh. So Matthew is very purposeful in saying, I don't want to be offensive to these people. I want them to know that this is the king they've been waiting for. So he uses this language of the kingdom of heaven. But just so you know, this morning, it's synonymous with the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17... We read, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Then it continues in verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news. This is the gospel of the kingdom. Michael, last week, if you were here, he talked about that word for good news, gospel. It's this Greek word that's euangelion. And euangelion, even in uh, literature outside of the Bible in the first century, it would have been a word that was used, it really could be translated to announcement. But it was an announcement in which when it was spoken, life was different for everybody, and it always had to do with an emperor or a king stepping on to their throne. That there was a new king, that there was a new emperor. So the gospel proclamation here is Jesus saying, there is a new king, I am stepping in as the king on his throne and you are invited to be citizens of my kingdom. Repent for the good news of the kingdom is near. All right, I have a confession to make. When I hear repent and I hear good news, those don't seem very synonymous to me. 
I don't know if you all have any baggage with the word repent, but let me tell you this morning, I do, all right? Like I go back in time and I remember being like a middle schooler at a youth camp and there was this guy who was speaking and he was really angry and I didn't know I was angry, but he was just really angry the whole time. And he walked around preaching with a giant chain in his hand that was like really big and he would drag it with him everywhere. And when he wanted to make a point, he'd like let it hit the ground. And I was like, dude, I'll do whatever you say because I'm freaked out, you know? Like, you just tell me what decision I gotta make. I'm gonna make it so I can get out of here, you know? But so when I hear repent, it brings up a lot of baggage for me. But what's beautiful about this passage, y'all, is I hope that this redeems the word repent for you because it's actually an invitation from Jesus to step into a life of purpose. It's Jesus saying, look at a world where everything has gone wrong. And y'all, 2,000 years later, will we not say that we can look at a world that is groaning, a world where things have gone awry? And Jesus is saying, hey, we can turn from that and live counterculturally. This is an invitation to step into a life of purpose. Jesus is saying, stop living like everyone else. You don't have to follow the patterns of this world. Here is an invitation to repent, to turn away from the status quo, to turn from the standards of this world and to step into the abundant life, a life of purpose, a life that will change the world. The people of God had been awaiting a king who would come in and they'd start, he'd start overthrowing the authorities and he would be fighting power with violence. They were thinking that that was what was gonna happen. And Jesus is saying, y'all, I am not here so you will look exactly like the world. As a matter of fact, what I'm saying is turn from exactly what the world looks like, y'all, and start walking this way. And then guess what? You will become world changers. That's the beauty of this passage. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Y'all is an invitation to step into a life of purpose and step into a life where we can be world changers. So I pray that when you hear that word, it'll bring something up in you that says, I'm a world changer. That I step into as a citizen of God's kingdom to be someone who can be salt and light into the world. So the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. If you're anything like me, I've heard that terminology used for a really long time, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. And I was like, yeah, I kind of get it, but I kind of also don't get it because it's used a lot and I don't really understand what it's saying. You know, it's really amazing about the book of Matthew that's unique to any other gospel. Jesus says that and then he says, well, let me tell you exactly what I mean. Let me tell you exactly what the kingdom of heaven looks like. And then in chapters five, six, and seven, right after Jesus makes this proclamation, he unpacks exactly what the kingdom of heaven looks like. So if you wanna read those few chapters later, you can. I'm just gonna read a little bit of it today, but it's really beautiful that we can see what the kingdom of heaven looks like. In Matthew chapter five, verse three, we read this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus starts this entire sermon by saying, hey, first we gotta start with salvation. Like before we move on to what exactly the kingdom of heaven looks like, first you have to say, God, look into my heart and I need to come before you and say that I can't clean myself up. Only you can do that. This is a message of desperation that we would just come before the Lord and say, I need you. And that's how Jesus begins. Then he goes on to say, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This is meaning a heart that would break over sin, that we would break over sin because we know it's our sin that sent Jesus to the cross. It's that big of a deal. But what's really stinking beautiful about this passage, y'all, is that there's a promise to that. It's not just live in in a season of shame or live in a season of condemnation. No, it's a heart that would break over sin And when it's broken, you have a father, you have a God who would embrace you and comfort you and not leave you in that place. So your heart would break and then we have a God who would embrace you and build you up. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. This is quite simply just saying, God, I am no longer Lord of my life. Here are the keys to my life and now you are Lord, your will be done. Not my own, but your will. Verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This would be that there's something in us 
that when we would see a world full of injustices, it would move us to not only be moved, but it would move us to action. That when we see orphans and we see widows, when we see racial inequalities, when we see those that maybe don't have a voice, that as people of God within the kingdom, we would then say, I'm gonna step into this and I am gonna be a world changer. When there's injustices happening, I'm gonna speak up for those that don't have a voice, that I'm gonna be moved to action, that we would hunger and thirst for righteousness. Verse seven, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is that we would be a people in the kingdom of God who are marked by forgiveness. That we would be those people who would forgive the people around us. Why? Because God has been so merciful to us and has forgiven us so much. I wanna make it very clear that does not mean that it's easy to do, am I right? That can be tremendously difficult, but that we would be a people who are marked by forgiveness. Verse eight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That word pure, It comes from a Greek word that mostly talked about clean water, a water that you would be okay with drinking, that there would be a purity in us and our actions, our feelings, our thoughts, our deeds. And then it's amazing again, there's a promise. It means that the more that we strive after purity, the clearer God is in our lives, that we will see him more clearly. And the last beatitude I wanna talk about this morning is this, verse nine, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Y'all, for a really long time, when I read about peacemakers, I always thought it just meant passivity. Like it was just like, now I'm I'm just not gonna speak up. I'm gonna kind of just go to the back. That is not what Jesus is talking about. As a matter of fact, his examples for us would show us that when he saw injustices, like in the den of thieves, that he would overturn the tables to fight for those that didn't have a voice. So peacemaker does not mean passivity. Peacemaker means that when you see two warring factions that you would have the audacity to step in and fight for reconciliation, even when it's difficult. It's not passivity. It's stepping in and fighting for reconciliation. But there's a lot more in the Sermon on the Mount. As a matter of fact, we spent like four months going over at at Emerge and I had like eight minutes. So uh, you could read the rest of it, chapters five, six, and seven, but one of, the, one of the last things I wanted to say that I love so much is that then Jesus says, as those that are invited into his kingdom, you are called to be salt and light into the world. And what does that mean? That means when we become citizens of the kingdom of God, when we say yes to Jesus as being the king of our lives, that we are called to be world changers in such a way that we are not called to be a separatist movement that would then like go out in the middle of nowhere and live our own thing. No, we are called to live in a culture that's going that way, but to be salt and light and to go this way within our culture, that you would begin to see the culture shift because we would step into culture and be salt and light in a dark place that you could do it right now in your community, in your home, in your workplace. This is real and it's tangible that we can be salt and light to the world. And one of the things that I love so much about this topic, y'all, that I hope you hear today is that this is for the here and now. Now is the time. Jesus is not saying that this is gonna happen later. Jesus is saying you can step into kingdom living, you can be a world changer. I am the king of your life now, that now is the time. And that's his prayer to the father in Matthew chapter six in the Lord's prayer, right? He says in verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now is the time to step into kingdom living. I heard this story a little while ago about this guy, his name is Keenan Lowe. Uh, Keenan Lowe is a, uh, he's a football coach at a high school um, and he's also a security officer at a high school. Well, in May, he got a phone call and was asked to come to a classroom because he thought there was a student, they thought there was a student there who was acting erratically. And Keenan showed up into this classroom and found that a student was in the classroom and uh, he had a gun and they didn't know what was gonna happen. And here's what Keenan says about the story. He says, the doors opened. I'm within arm's length of the door, about three feet away from the door, and there's this kid with a gun. In a fraction of a second, I analyzed everything really fast. I saw the look on his face and the look in his eyes. 
Well, then at the bottom of the story, it has surveillance footage of what happened next. And y'all, I was blown away by what happened. And we have a, a clip of that in a second. There's no audio to it. And I also want you to know that I edited out any parts that could be a little scary. But I just want you to see how Keenan responds to this student who had this gun in this video. Keenan said that when he walked out, the student yelled, no one cares about me. Keenan hugged him and said, I care about you. I do, bro. That's why I'm here. I got you, buddy. I'm gonna be honest, when I clicked on that video, that's not what I expected to see. I did not expect to see a man who would wrap his arms around the student and say, I love you. Like You are known. I care about you. You're not alone. The amazing thing is that student, he just showed up with one bullet in his gun. He was going to commit suicide because he felt like such an outsider at his school. Keenan saved his life, maybe saved the lives of others. But what's really incredible is that this student is not in jail. He's on probation and he's getting mental health help now. Y'all, it's amazing to me that Keenan would step in and do something that was unlike anything that I anticipated would happen. And maybe that's because culture has infiltrated my heart a little bit. But when I saw that, I just thought, that's a kingdom movement. I read a little bit later that Keenan, he worked for the San Francisco 49ers and he started to feel a stirring in him that he was called to make a difference. And one of his best friends overdosed and died. And the reason why he went back to the school to become a teacher is because he believed that that's where God had called him to make a difference. He later said in an interview, he believes with all his heart that it was God's will that he would be there in that moment. It's so counter-cultural. It's so counter to what I expected would happen. That's the upside down kingdom, right? See so y'all, we are called into a life of purpose. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near is not to shame you. It's to say that you can turn from what the culture looks like and be salt and light into this world. The end of Matthew, we read this, which is the Great Commission. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The bottom line is that Jesus is king and we have been invited into his kingdom. And then Jesus would end this gospel in the book of Matthew by saying, now go invite others. Go extend the parameters of the kingdom and invite others to be a part. Jesus is king, and we are called to be citizens in his kingdom. And now is the time. Y'all, I will be leaving in about 15 minutes to get in a car and drive about, I don't know how many hours it is, to Nashville to go record uh, a couple of songs. It's been like six years in the making of a new project. And I wrote this song uh, years ago called Now is the Time. And I wrote it from the perspective of what it must have been like for the Israelites in Malachi, just waiting, just waiting on the Lord. But then you'll, you'll hear hopefully in these lyrics that then the hope of the fact that a king has come. So this morning, I really just want this to be a continuation of the sermon, that we would just reflect on these words as we just uh, end this time of worship together. You see? 
see the breaking spirit of God. Your bride is yearning for the day. The moment has come. Prepare. King of glory, swing wide the gates and into your story. Oh, we are waiting, oh, we are ready for you, Lord. You are our hope on the horizon, the beauty that shines. Thousands of diamonds. Oh, we are waiting. Oh, we are ready for you, Lord. Forever, always, eternity's present, and we will be. The moment has come, prepare the way. Now is the time, O oh King of glory, and swing wide the gates and into your storm. into your story and we are ready yes we are ready for you God we thank you just for the opportunity that we have to come before you to exalt your name God I pray that every time that we gather here in this space the loft will be a special time will be a time that is holy a time that is set apart because we believe that you are with us. So I pray that we never miss that. God, I pray that across this room, my heart included, that we would have hearts that just says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, you are king. And we are so thankful that you would call us to co-labor with you, to be citizens of your kingdom. God, thank you so much for showing up and being here today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all are dismissed. Thank you so much for being here.